G'day Earthlings, Dr. Rank here, and welcome to Gaming Legends, the show that's about to receive a dozen comments about my pronunciation. After spending three games battling his former general, Dr. Neo Cortex has decided to replace him with his newest recruit, the Avatar. Now, I have no skill with airbending, but I'm definitely interested in bending the laws of physics. Can you beat Crash Bandicoot, the Wrath of Cortex, without spinning? This run is being performed on the European PlayStation 2 Platinum release of the game, the version that's most convenient for me personally. As per the norm, we're trying to beat the game without ever performing a spin attack or facsimile thereof. And as a bonus challenge, we're going for the maximum possible completion percentage. One other thing I have to mention is that the Xbox and GameCube versions allow you to start with a 106% save file by entering Wombat as your name. This cheat code is completely banned, but I can't use it on PS2 anyway. Without further ado, let the run begin. Arctic Antics is a great introduction to our rule set. Without the spin attack, we have to resort to other methods of breaking boxes. We can jump on them, we can slide into them, and we can use Aku Aku Invincibility. However, you might have noticed one glaring omission in that sentence. While we do have access to the belly flop in this game, the super belly flop is also here. Unlike the other superpowers though, it's locked behind a secret path that isn't accessible until the late game, making it much less useful. Whenever I play this game casually, I often add a rule that I can't use the regular belly flop until I unlock the super one. And I will be following that same rule here, which means that reinforced crates are temporarily immortal. Fortunately, in this instance, we can fight immortality with immortality. All of the reinforced crates in Arctic Antics coincidentally have Aku Aku crates nearby. If we enter the level with two masks already, we can use Aku Aku to break them all, allowing us to get the gem. We can also get the blue gem from the death route, which isn't any harder than usual, as well as the relic from time trial mode. Unlike other Crash games, Wrath of Cortex lets you keep your masks during the time trial, meaning invincibility is much more accessible. Next I did Wizards and Lizards, which has a stack of four crates right at the start, the bottom of which are reinforced. Crash's normal jump only goes two crates high, and his slide jump only bumps it up to three. We could take out this stack with a belly flop, but again, I can't belly flop yet, and there aren't any masks in the vicinity either. We'll be missing out on the box gem for now, but we can at least get the green gem. The time trial in Wizards and Lizards is also a bit harder than usual. Time crates in this game only freeze the timer if broken either by you or by a TNT or Nitro explosion, meaning the dragon isn't going to help us. Thankfully, the gold and platinum relics in this game are completely worthless and the sapphire is still doable. And no, I can't just press select to teleport straight to the end, that only works on the American Black Label PS2 version, which I'm not using. Compactor Reactor opens with a minecart section where the only interesting thing that happens is the ignorance of the yellow gem path. You'll also be happy to know that there isn't a single reinforced crate in this level, so the box gem is finally easy. Tornado Alley is a play level which might be giving you some flashbacks, but the controls work differently this time. Instead of doing a barrel roll with the square button, you can do a dodge roll with the L2 and R2 buttons. While I didn't see any reason to ban this move, I decided to go without it anyway, and while it does reduce our defensive abilities, there's no major impact. Bamboozled and the Rumble in the Rocks boss level use the Atlasphere, which moves around by rolling, not by spinning. A subtle distinction, but an important one. This means we can easily get our fifth crystal, beat up Earth Crunch, and obtain the Sneak Shoes ability. Jungle Rumble has four reinforced crates to break, all lumped together in the same area. There are two Aku Aku crates nearby, but when I first visited this level, I didn't have any masks on me. Fortunately, we can use the age-old strategy of being bad at video games. We can die several times in the same spots to get extra masks at the checkpoint, then use the existing ones to get invincibility. There is also a TNT sandwich in the bonus round, but luckily you can slide to take out just the bottom crate in this game. 
Bonsai Bonsai is our first Coco level, and unlike the Ensane Trilogy, she has her own unique moveset. Pressing square makes her do a spin kick, which for our purposes counts as a spin. Pressing circle in mid-air uses her stomp attack, which also gets upgraded with the super belly flop, so we won't be using it until then. That just leaves her grounded circle attack, the sweep kick, which is just a slower version of Crash's slide. And no, she doesn't have her phone in this game. Enemies are going to be a lot harder to take out, but certainly not impossible. What is impossible though, is the bonus round. These two crates near the end are too high up to jump onto, and too close to the edge to get a proper footing. Since Coco has no way to attack in the air without spinning, and isn't capable of doing a high jump, we can't break these boxes. There is an Aku Aku crate near the bonus platform, but given the shortened invisibility timer, I doubt we can make use of it. This level also houses the super belly flop, but we need the red gem before we can get it. H2O No starts off in a submarine that specializes in projectiles before transitioning back on foot. We don't have any difficulties getting the crystal, but the gem is another story. Not only is there a reinforced crate here with no Aku Aku crates within striking distance, there's also a single crash crate that can only be reached with a double jump. Otherwise though, it's not too bad. Then there's Seashell Shenanigans, which takes place entirely underwater. While the latter half uses the sub, the former half uses the scuba gear. Just like in Crash 3, the only way to attack is by spinning, which doesn't look promising. There's a diver blocking the path just before the checkpoint, but we can damage boost right through them. Unfortunately, that's as far as we can get. A single box lies in the middle of the underwater tube, and Crash's hitbox is ever so slightly too wide to squeeze past it. And remember how the PS1 version of Crash 3 lets you break boxes from above with a fast kick? Well, forget it, because you can't do that here. It is impossible to beat this level without spinning. But whenever God closes a door, he also breaks open a window. There's a weird quirk with the flying levels in this game, including level 9, that sinking feeling. When the last target is destroyed, the game waits a few seconds before giving you the crystal to let the lengthy victory animation play. The Firefly's death animation is even lengthier, so if you hit the last ship and lose all your health at the same time with proper timing, you can grab the crystal just before you die and respawn. Since the game doesn't expect you to get the crystal without leaving, you can play the level normally afterwards to collect the crystal a second time. And as long as you did that sinking feeling last, this will let you enter the drain damage boss level without even playing level 7. Unfortunately, this trick only lets you skip the levels in the same warp room. For reasons known only to a colorblind programmer at Traveler's Tales with questionable priorities, access to the boss levels isn't dictated by the crystal count. Instead, it's based on the number of times you finish a level from that warp room with a crystal in your possession. We didn't get an extra crystal from that sinking feeling, we just grabbed the same one twice. And while we were able to fool Wawa and can safely enter the final boss without that crystal, the other elementals don't have jurisdiction here. Speaking of Wawa, Water Crunch is the only boss that even remotely puts up a fight. His hitbox is really big, which can sometimes prevent you from landing on the platform for a slide. But if you wait until he leans back for an attack, you'll have plenty of room to stand. Defeating Water Crunch gives us the double jump, which should make platforming easier. Well, for Crash anyway. Coco can't use it. For Crash though, we can combine it with a crouch jump to go up to 5 crates high, which comes in handy here in the Gauntlet. This level also has a death route containing the purple gem, which isn't any harder than usual. Tsunami is another Coco level, but thankfully none of the boxes are impossible this time. Though we do need to die at least once, as the blue gem path is impossible if you hit the nitro switch crate. Good thing gems are retained when you die. Fahrenheit's Frenzy opens with a copter pack section, which works much like the jetpack in Crash 2. If you remember, the jetpack could break boxes from above or below just by flying into them. 
The Copter Pack can also break them from below, but only from below. And there are several boxes in this section that are far too low for the propeller to hit them, so no jam for you. Thankfully, the path to the on-foot area isn't obstructed, so we can finish the level normally from there. The time trial is technically harder since not as many time crates are breakable, but the Sapphire Relic is just barely achievable. Smokey and the Bandicoot, Eskimo Roll, and Crashes to Ashes are all based around vehicles, so none of them pose any threat. Beating Fire Crunch does unlock the totally useless Tornado Spin, but thankfully there's no future Frenzy fans in this game, so we don't have to worry about skipping it. Avalanche is yet another Coco level, but it's pretty chill. No pun intended. That is, until you get to the bonus round and find two reinforced crates. At least we can get the hidden gem by completing the slalom course. Droid Void brings back our old nemesis monkey bars, which takes away your ability to slide. And they're even worse in this game because Crash moves slower than a Bomugulan Slagvor. None of the boxes hanging from them can be broken in our current state, so it's a good thing they don't block our path in this level. Once you reach the mech suit, the rest of the level plays out normally, including the purple gem path. Weathering Heights has more monkey bars, but for once, there aren't any crates on them. Not that it matters, since the bonus round has two reinforced crates right at the end. Wow, if I had a nickel for every time I was doomed by a pair of reinforced crates in the bonus round, I'd have two nickels, which isn't a lot, but it's weird that it happened twice, right? Coral Canyon is the inverse of seashell shenanigans. Instead of starting with scuba gear and ending with a submarine, it starts with a sub and ends with scuba. Shortly after the transition is an area where you can get stuck underneath a box on the ocean floor, the only way out of which is to either spin or pause and quit. Immediately after that though, we hit a wall. A crate wall to be exact. There's no way past here without spinning, and just getting here in the first place is a nightmare with how many things want to kill us. But, oh, w would you look at that? It's another window we can smash open. Level 18 Crash Droids is another flight level, which opens up the opportunity for another crystal duplication. This one isn't quite so simple though, since the spaceship's death animation is much shorter than the Fireflies. Thankfully, the colorblind programmer at Traveler's Tales decided to throw us a bone. Near the bottom of the stage is an invisible area that kills Coco instantly if she flies into it, which speedrunners have dubbed the Black Hole. If we hit the Black Hole at the same time we grab the crystal, we can duplicate it once again. For best results, I recommend saving the satellite closest to Earth for last. Each satellite has 40 HP and gives one Wumper Fruit per hit, so bring it down to 1 HP by using the Fruit Counter as a guide. Once the other two are dead, approach it from below with the Earth slightly to its right and hold the Fire button to hit it the exact moment it comes within range. If you explode at just the right time, congratulations! The crystal has been duplicated. And, despite having only 18 crystals, atmospheric pressure is now fully accessible, letting us beat up Air Crunch and unlock the coveted Fruit Bazooka. With this baby, we can shoot just about anything, even boxes on monkey bars. The only downside is that it's exclusive to Crash, and only during on-foot gameplay. The first thing I did in Warproom 5 was head into the death route in Crash and Burn. The final gap looks too wide to cross without the tornado spin, but we can still grab the red gem by choosing it with the bazooka. Now that we've got that, we can complete the secret path in Bonsai Bonsai and finally unlock the super belly flop. Reinforced crates are no longer immortal, so we're free to go back and get all the box gems we missed before. Except those two. Gold Rush has an uncomfortable amount of monkey bars, and while you can hit most of the obstacles with the bazooka, there's a pair of scorpions that are just out of reach. Luckily, they move back and forth along the Z-axis, so we can just time our movements carefully to get past them. This does make the time trial much slower, but not undoable. And we can get one final death route for the yellow gem, letting us clean up the gem path in Compactor Reactor. Medieval Madness is an atmosphere level, and Crate Balls of Fire is mostly a mech suit level, so nothing to see here. 
Cortex Vortex has only one thing that could be remotely considered a roadblock, and it's in the green gem path. The fastest way past these nitros would be to blow them up with a the bazooka, then jump over the gap. But since that strategy requires the tornado spin, we'll be tiptoeing across them instead. With all the Warproof 5 crystals in hand, we can take on the final level, Crunch Time. This is the only boss fight in the entire series where the bazooka is not only allowed, but is also the dev intended method of attacking Crunch. Each hit causes him to regain a small amount of free will and punch Cortex in the face, who we can then kick in the face. With the speed shoes fastened to our heels once again, and Uka Uka firmly reminding us that we're not done yet, the Wrath of Cortex spinless run is officially conquered. And now that we've beaten the game, we can access Warp Room 6, which houses a few extra levels unlocked with the relics. Most of these are vehicle levels though, and don't pose any real threat. Nighttime is just the gauntlet again, but it's dark and you're Coco, and it's not too bad. Ice Station Bandicoot uses the Copter Pack again, but all the boxes here are attached to balloons, which can all be popped with the propeller. And unlike its counterpart in Crash 3, the rings don't make you go any faster if you spin through them. This means every single gem and relic in Warp Room 6 is a breeze. Our final totals for the Wrath of Cortex spinless run are 23 crystals, 6 superpowers, 42 gems, 28 relics, and 98% completion. The true ending sadly requires all 46 gems, and there's no way in hell we're getting the last four. Still, this might just be one of my favorite spinless runs I've ever done, though I don't recommend it unless you're already a speedrunner. Before I go, shout out once again to Tedeyu who did a similar run trying to beat the game without the square button. And double shout out to the current any percent world record holder Cody, whose run was used as reference for the crystal dupe setup. If you want to watch my run, you can check out the live stream archives in the description. And be sure to subscribe and ring the bell so you don't miss the next challenge run. That's all for now, and I will see you down under.